God. There's Funko Mary. Only YouTube listeners get to see that in my blooper. Welcome to episode 109 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Tonight, I am joined by Darren, a guy who thinks it's a crime anytime I sing. I am his tone-deaf co-host, Mary. And anybody who has heard me sing knows that I can't carry a tune to save my life. Welcome, Darren. Song you, How are you? How's thank it going? You. Oh, thank you so much. The best song you sing is The Sound of Silence. Trust me. It's all good. In it's the all sound good. of Oh, silence. that's not what I meant. In any case, how are you? What's going on with you? What's new? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I, I, you kidding me? It's, sun, it's nothing but soft serving sunshine over here, Mary. Having a great day. It's the springtime, Memorial Day weekend. Life is good. Yeah. And we'll get and back on the before, saddle again. Before you can call me out for being a bad host, what are you drinking? And I don't know what mug. Oh, my God. I never thought you'd ask. Thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate it. It is called Voodoo Ranger. It is called Juice Force IPA from whereabouts. I'm not sure where it comes from, but it's pretty good. And I'm drinking it out of my William T. Sherman. I dream. Of a brighter Atlanta coffee mug, Mary, because we're going to talk about Sherman and the Atlanta campaign. We are. That being said, I'm going to reciprocate the favor and say, what are you Ooh. drinking tonight, Mary? <laughs> I am drinking Voodoo Ranger Imperial IPA, and I'm drinking it out of my, I'm not going to hold it up in camera because when you have a background on Zoom, it totally screws up. I'm drinking it out of my Sherman 1864 Atlanta's original torchbearer mug. Um, because as you said, Sherman is going to figure into tonight's episode quite prominently. Um, and, you know, we've been in the Eastern Theater for a few weeks discussing the Battle of Spotsylvania, um, but we decided to head back to the Western Theater to talk about another battle that happens at almost the same time it happens just a few days later, and that is the Battle of Pickett's Mills, which is going to turn out to be the second deadliest battle on the Atlanta campaign. I mean, it's very, very bloody. Now, you mentioned before, 1864 was a brutal year in the American Civil War. It's the third summer of the war. Yep. You've got the Overland campaign, speaking of Spotsylvania, we did last week, going, getting ready to go across the, um, you know, in the east. But here, you know, this is a situation where the march to Atlanta is taking place. And it's almost like, you know, the dead were kind of, um, it was, the people coming immune to it at this point. The, the, yep. the butcher's bill is getting higher and higher. But, you know, Let's talk real quick about how this whole land thing sets up too. Okay, we've been focused on the east, but to go back to the west. Now, after the, that Union victory at Chattanooga in November of 1863, General U.S. Grant Mary, he's now in charge of the general in chief of all U.S. armies. Mm -hmm. He's going to go east to begin that that aforementioned Overland campaign, but he's going to assign his subordinate, William T. Sherman Mary. He's going to be in charge of capturing Atlanta. Yeah. Now, we have a lot of fun with Sherman and the burn all this stuff, but, but there's a strategy to this. And Atlanta was a prime railroad hub. It was a manufacturing center. And it was, a, it, was, it was a type of city that you had to have to remove any threat of that rebel war effort in that region. So capturing the city of Atlanta was of utmost importance to Grant as well as the Union Army. They had mm -hmm. to have it. And it's also an election year, too. So keep in mind, there's that as well for just kind of, a, you know, that's really going to help Lincoln win the election, too, if they the, can the, capture the city. There's a lot of moving parts of this. So on May 5th, 1864, Sherman is going to have 110,000 troops, and he's going to have three armies we're going to talk about real quick. The Army of the Cumberland, which, of course, is controlled and commanded by George Thomas. The, the Rock Army of Chickamauga. The Rock of, of, of Chickamauga. Mill Springs, too, if I remember correctly. Yeah. The Army of the Tennessee, which is going to be commanded by James Burbsey McPherson, as well as the Army of the Ohio, which is now commanded by John Schofield. Now, we're not going to go on a painful detail of the Atlanta campaign, but they had to march 120 miles from Chattanooga, the gateway mm -hmm. to the south, to Atlanta. And this monster of an army is going to march along a supply line, which is going to be on the tracks of the Western and Atlantic Railroad. Now, Georgia at this time of year is hot. It's just, it's that yeah, it's spring. Humid, it's hot, sticky. it's humid, but they're walking along this, this, this track, okay? Standing in Sherman's way is going to be Joseph E. Johnson and the Army of Tennessee. Now, they're going to have about 60, 65 or so thousand men. So they're going to have almost, not quite 50%, but they're not going to have a lot of guys compared to Sherman. His job, for the most part, is going to be to try to slow Sherman's roll. Do whatever yep. he can to delay him getting into Atlanta. And it's going to lead to a bunch of skirmishes. We're not going to talk in detail of all of them, but uh, Battle of Rocky Face Ridge is going to be one. Um, Rasaka is mm -hmm. going to be another one. 
And what happens is whenever Sherman hits, Johnston is going to fight and then he's going to fall back. Yeah. And it's going to force Sherman to go around and kind of keep bobbing and weaving. Floored, you know, Mayweather. That's kind of yeah. what he's going to basically be doing. And Sherman's going to go around Johnson's flank and it's going to just keep causing him to fall back. And that's going to be kind of a repeating theme as he marches along this Western Atlantic Railroad. Johnson's army is going to get bigger, though. It's going to get bigger because they're going to get Leonidas Polk. He's going to get him, his army of Mississippi, and this is going to fall back again. They're going to battle at the Battle of Adairsville. Uh, and again, when they get past where, where it's called and where Rome, Georgia is, this is on May 17th now. And Johnson at this point is trying to find a way to set a trap for Sherman. Yeah. He's just trying to think of a way. And after that engagement, and there's about a 9,000, 10,000 man engagement, it did, you know, it slowed Sherman and it did allow Johnson again to fall back. This time they're going to cross that Etowa River. And, and this is going to be the middle of the night, but they're going to sacrifice Dalton, Georgia. And this is going to be a huge morale killer mm -hmm. for, the, for the men in his army because they did not want to keep falling back. They wanted to fight and losing Dalton kind of. It, it kind of took a little of the steam out of the sails of, of Johnston as far as how what they thought of him. They were getting they were getting tired of it. Is kind of what I'm trying to get at, right? Yeah, yeah. The, it's the constant bobbing and the weaving and the falling back. And I mean, both sides are are getting worn down, um, you know, worn out. And it's like kind of these. They're not the big battles that you're seeing in the eastern theater at this time in the overland campaign the atlanta campaign is is the battles are a little bit smaller scale like not too much but still they're not but there's you know enough of them that sherman is slowly like losing men and so is johnston like they're both kind of in the same position with this right they were so may 19th johnson's gonna fall back to the fall back in the town of Cassville, georgia mm. and this is um this is when johnson is going to have that council of war he's going to have a council of war with the united Polk. And, and he's going to have a consul with, with John Bell Hood. They're going to meet at the home of William Neal McKelvey. And this is in Bartow County. Now, I mention this because Andrew McKelvey is a listener of this podcast. And I talked to him recently. He came That's into my cool. office. And we talked about this. So he's a That's relative. Cool. He's, he's been on site. And we were talking about this. But his, on the site of his, one of his relatives was this council of war. And they talked about what do we do? Do we stay on this Cassville line and try to fight here? Or do we fall back? You know what they do? They go, you know what? We got to fall back because yeah. where we are is, is very vulnerable to artillery. So we need to keep falling back. And that's what they're going to ultimately decide to do. Now, where they fall back to is a place called Alatuna Pass. Mm -hmm. Now, Alatuna Pass, if you've been there, we, we've been there too. It's, a, it's two mountains with a railroad yep. track running right through the middle of it. Very similar so, in a way to Ringgold Gap. Very similar Ringo Gap, exactly. So if Sherman's going to stay along the Western Atlantic Railroad, he's going to have to march down this railroad track right between these two mountains. It is a perfect place for Johnson to set up an army in ambush. This is going to be the site where the great locomotive chase takes place with mm -hmm. the general back in, in, in uh, earlier in 1862. It'll also be the site of a future battle later in 1864 in October, uh, after Atlanta fell, it's going to, they're going to fight here. But for here, this is where Johnson is going to try to is going to want to set up. Yeah. And if he sets up just right, he might be able to bag him. And this is very favorable ground for the most part. And Sherman, he he's not stupid, and that's the no. thing. And right? he's he's also been here before. Now it's been twenty years. He was last year in eighteen forty four. Um, but, you know, in his younger days, he kind of toured around the South. And the thing with Sherman is today he would have what is termed a photographic memory. So you see stuff like it's, yeah, pornographic, yeah, photographic. What are you thinking? <laughs> oh, <it's so> bad. <laughs> anyway, there's got to be a Savannah joke in here somewhere. Um, in marching to Savannah, man. Yeah. Um, anyway, so Sherman is very good at remembering what places look like. And if anyone's read his memoirs, you know how descriptive he is that he can paint a, literally like a picture of what the place looks like. You can imagine it in your mind. And that's because like he could remember stuff so well. And that's the case with Alatona is he can remember it and he knows it. And that's his advantage. Well, he knows it. He's like, well, if I'm flipping the coin here, if I'm, if I'm going to defend and I'm, if I have half as many men, 
the where's the best place to set up? It's Alatoona. And he knows that. And so he's going to change his plan. Now, this is May 21st, now 1864. He's already marched exactly halfway between Chattanooga and Atlanta already. So he's making pretty good time. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to basically decide, okay, here's the deal. I can't go through this Alatoona Pass. So I need to decide what I'm going to do. And he figures this is going to be a trap. So he's going to tell his men, we're going to take 20 days of rations. We're going to leave our supply line along the Atlantic and Western Railroad. And we are going to go through the woods and we're going to leave and we're going to start moving out. So that's what they're going to do. That, that's that got gonna... F this written all over it for me. Well, I've, been, I mean... I've been in the woods in Georgia and it sucks. Like, no thanks. Well, so he's going to go southwest along some dirt roads from a deep forest in Cassville. Mm-hmm. And they're going to move towards the town of Dallas, Georgia, which is 22 miles away from Cassville. They're going to go through the woods. And he's thinking, okay, once we get to Dallas, we can pass Alatoona. It's going to set up a couple different options for me. I can move back east again to reconnect with the railroad, or I can stay in the woods and take Atlanta that way. So he's going to give it's going to give Sherman a couple of options. Sherman is going to wire Nashville, the supply hub, and he's going to he's I'm going to I'm going to quote here. He's going to say, "We are now all in motion." like a vast hive of bees and expect a swarm across the Chattahoochee in five days. And that's what he's going to say. Now, keep in mind, five days, right? Yeah, Robert E.B. Robert E.B., that's what he's going to do. <laughs> but there's an obvious problem in this strategy, and this, of course, is the terrain. And we've mentioned before the big three that screw you in battle, right? Yep. Communication, Communication weather, and, and terrain. terrain. And in this case, at this portion of the battle, it's going to be terrain. Mm-hmm. By leaving that railroad line and moving through this deep brush, they are going to be in the absolute bush. And mm-hmm. there's very few maps of the area. And for the most part, it's it's basically impossible to get through. You can, it's very mm-hmm. difficult to move through. What this does, though, it causes delays. So now it takes two full days now for Sherman to get near Dallas. Two days. Yep. These two days are going to be huge for Joseph E. Johnson. Yeah. It's going to give him time to fall back and set up a defensive line. He's going to find out of Sherman's plan through Joseph uh, Wheeler's cavalry yep. that he's leaving the supply line. So now he's going to fall back and he's going to pull his entire army back southwest of Dallas. He's going to set up a defensive line one mile south of Dallas at a crossroads called New Hope Church. Yep, and this is where and, there's going to be a battle eventually fought here too. Yeah, but 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 this line that John set up is formidable though. It's going to extend mm-hmm. six miles. New Hope Church is going to be for the most part on the right kind of the, the mm-hmm. right of the line, but the line is going to be called the Dallas New Hope Church Pickett's Mill Line, and it's going to be a formidable line. Yeah, it's gigantic. So Sherman is going to bumble into this line on May 25th, mm-hmm. which is going to lead to like the. Well, you mentioned the Battle of New Hope Church. Now, yep. I'm not going to talk about the details. We can do a whole other episode of this one, yep. but we're going to, we're going to kind of just, just, but suffice it to say, Sherman is going to have a bad day here. Yeah. He's going to lose 1,600 men. Johnson's going to lose 400, basically four to one ratio. Even for a map major like you, you can figure that Dude. one out. But it's going to be a significant loss for Sherman. So, Sherman, the next day on May 26, is going to be sitting around. And as these armies are resting, he's going to come up with a new plan to get Joseph E. Johnson. And that plan is going to be to try to get around the Confederate right. And so what he's going to do, he's going to set up 14,000 men, and he's going to go around the far right, which is about two miles away. And they're going to target a place called Pickett's Mill, which is the home of Fanny Fanny Pickett, Mary. Yep. Right. 20, 29 year old mother of four who'd lost her husband at Chickamauga. Adelaide, first Georgia, Calvary, yep. right. It's 29 mother of four. She's she's a widow. So the next morning on May 27 at 10 o'clock in the morning, 14,000 men are going to be placed in charge under the command of Oliver Otis Howard, the one armed Christian general, the man who is on a poster above your bed. Oliver Otis Howard oh is going to be in charge of this 14,000 man advanced force designed to go around the Confederate yeah. right. Now, this army is going to be a hodgepodge. So we combine a combination of three different armies, the 3rd yeah. Division of Howard's 4th Corps under Thomas J. Wood. Yep, of Chickamauga first, fame. Yep, the 1st Division of the 14th Corps under Richard W. Johnson. Mm-hmm. 
in the 3rd Brigade of the 3rd Division of John Schofield's uh, 23rd Corps. So he's got a 14. There's a lot of men. Right? Yeah, it's a very mishmash of, of men. And, you know, Schofield said, um, one of the officers of Schofield said, nothing has transpired as yet to indicate whether the enemy are in force, but it is supposed they are on the defensive and awaiting for us. So they really don't know. This is kind of, in a way, like Spotsylvania. They're going into this part um, of the march, like, blind. You know, for instance, like, they don't have cavalry screening ahead of them, just like, Bar. you know, like, Lee didn't have that either at the Battle of Spotsylvania, and I think Barlow was basically somewhat without that, too. Um, you know, there's no there's no cavalry screening at all, so they don't really know, so they're going into this blindly. Um, and the Confederates, like you said, they've already been spotted, and because of this, there's shifting and moving going on. Um, you know, they've got Hood shifts the division of Thomas Hinman to the right, and they're in high ground in a very good position. And later that day, the Irish Confederate General Claiborne, he's ordered to fur to the right to further extend the Confederate line to the east. Lucius Polk, who is the nephew of the fighting bishop, is going to be placed on Hinman's right. And on Polk's, they're going to have a 12-gun artillery battery. And in support of these guns was uh, General uh, Govan's division. And Claiborne's two other brigades led by Granberry and Lowry, are going to be second in line behind Polk. And during the night, the Confederates on the night of the 26th, they're going to start digging in. And this is the extreme right to Johnson's position. And this is what, as you said, becomes the Dallas New Hope Pickett's Mill line. And there's also two cavalry here under General John Kelly, and that's going to extend the line almost to Pickett's Mill Creek. So the Confederates got a lot of guys and they're going to be entrenched. So the yeah. next morning when Howard's at 10 o'clock in the morning, when Howard starts to move out, they have a two mile trip. They have to get to Pickett's Mill and they are immediately going to hit with that brutal terrain. And yeah. it was clear that nobody knew where they were going when they started. going. No, on this. no. Like I said, like they don't have, you know, this is an area like, like Sherman knew the area of Alatoona. I don't think he knew this area, the deep woods as well. And his plan is that like Sherman, the orders that he originally issues are basically Howard's fourth corps is going to wheel southward. And this probably means Sherman was going to intend another flanking maneuver. And the 23rd corps, the parts of them that are with them would be there to offer support. And Hooker is going to be launching a diversionary attack in his front. And Hooker's, you know, way, way away from where they are, right? And McPherson has been ordered to push his army of the Tennessee on the right toward New Hope Church. That's the original orders that Sherman issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the reality is if anybody who's been in Dallas, Georgia, and see those woods, I challenge you to take your keys, throw them in the woods, and go walk around and go find your way out of there. It's just – it's impossible. Do not it's recommend. very difficult. I mean we're talking steep hills. We're talking deep ravines. There's no roads to speak of. The army was on a full Rosewoods clown alert. There's no there's probably snakes. Oh God, you mentioned snakes for for God's sake. But but this <laughs> problem, it just it was it was brutal. So yeah. for hours, Howard's men are going to struggle to move through these woods. Now the trees were so thick they can maybe see a couple of feet in front of them, which must have been pretty scary when you consider the fact that they knew that the Confederate line was out there somewhere and they could literally walk right into them without even seeing them. In some cases, right? they were only just a few hundred yards away. Howard mentions in his memoirs, all day we plodded along pretty far back within sound of the skirmish firing on the front line. The march was over rough and poor roads where we had any roads at all. The way at times is almost impassable for the mud forest closed in on us either side. It's a very claustrophobic feeling. And um, General Wood, he's the one leading this, um, you know, his men are. And he said, for a mile, the march was nearly due southward through dense forests in the thickest jungle, a country whose surface was scarred by deep ravines and intersected by difficult ridges. And because of this, like, I mean, you know, you want to move your army pretty quickly. Well, it's pretty tough in this kind of terrain. And, you know, Wood talks about that there's frequent halts. They had to change direction all the time because of the terrain. And the other thing, too, is when, you know, you're going to change direction. I think you, you know, there's bugle calls happening. And the one thing that Sherman had wanted was to surprise them. And one soldier said, if we are expected to surprise the enemy, why don't they stop those damn bugles? Like, why, like the enemy is going to hear you. So, But the Confederates already know. They're you got 14,000 guys basically lost in the woods is what you really yeah. have. I mean, you can't. There's no ability to march in that column formation. Uh, it's just not too long for complete confusion starts within the within the Union ranks. 
They left at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's 4.30 p.m. now. Yeah, by the time they they get into position, it's like they get there and they marched about 1.5 miles and Howard and his staff go out to inspect the, the ground around them. And Howard says, I was standing in the edge of a wood with, with my glass falling along the lines of Johnston to see where the batteries were located and to ascertain if we had reached his limits. And Howard mentions that there was part of the terrain that made it impossible to see. And there could have been guys there. And Howard was like, I, I don't know. And this is when one of Howard's staff actually gets shot. And because he goes out ahead because he had a new glass, apparently, and he Uh wanted to test it out. So he's like, I'm going to go test it out. And Howard's probably like, I told you not to go out there. You're way too far. Anyway, he gets hit by, like, you know, probably a sniper or something. And Howard thinks he's gone, like dead. But he, the guy ends up recovering. But still, Uh like, it's that, that's how, you know, that's probably the, oh shit, they are, they're here. Like, we're this close to them. If the snipers can see and hit guys, then we're pretty close and howard said of the whole incident with his staff guy he said i thought i thought at first that my brave young friend was dead and intense grief seized my heart for harry was much beloved but like i said he ends up regaining consciousness and he survives and recovers um and howard could see the rebel earthworks but he said they did not seem to cover general wood's front and they were new the enemy still working hard on them Right, and so you're talking about four four thirty in the afternoon now, yep. and he and Howard is going is gonna message Sherman, and he he thinks he knows where he is, but he's gonna write, "I'm on a ridge beyond beyond the hill that we were looking at this morning. No one can appreciate the difficulty in moving over this ground unless you see it. I am now turning the enemy's right flank. I think that now, I if you're, if you're, I, if you're I, Sherman." I had to... Yeah. Right. If you're Sherman and you're getting this, okay, so this is pretty good. Okay. I think like you what? think or you know, Howard, like what is it like? And was there supposed to be a question mark in that order? Like, I think. And these orders, like I had to read them a couple times because if I had got this, I'd be like, this guy doesn't, he's not sure. And Howard's clearly not sure um what's going on, you know. But I think he's trying to like, you know, he's been asked to do this thing. Uh-huh. And you know, keep in mind he's probably still got kind of some of the ghosts of Chancellorsville following him along like please don't let me screw this up um but well, yeah the I, whole I, like if you read the words i think you're not sure i mean he he put that in there which is kind of a mind-numbing thing to say at that situation yeah, now think. howard howard's going to get intel from some prisoners they're going to catch some prisoners that patrick claiborne and thomas hinman's division were in his front and, and so at this point he's like you know what i found the flank I mean, yep. This is where they are. I, I know where they are. So he thinks I think but Ho- Howard was right. You know, he did. He did find the Confederate right flank, and not far from his position was Rebel cavalry under the command of John H. Kelly. You mentioned him earlier. Yeah, the man they called the Boy General of the Confederacy. He was only twenty-four years old, John Kelly. Oh. That's how young he was. Now, on the Confederate right was the division of Patrick Claiborne. Now, a man many consider the best in the Confederacy. We said that over and over and over again. It's tough. Mm-hmm. If you study his record, it's tough to argue with it. It yeah. just is, well, right? Here, well, here he's doing... Now, the interesting thing about, you know, May 27th, 1864, is it is, I think that would be six months to the day after Ringgold Gap, six or seven months to the day, November 27th, 1864. He's fighting this battle. And Govan had gone out earlier and he reported the Union troops moving to Claiborne. So Claiborne's been busy and his position's on high ground. It's an east-west ridge covered with trees and undergrowth. And the one thing he does is he conceals some of his troops behind the brush, much like he had done at Ringgold Gap. So he saw that worked for him before and it's going to work for him again. Uh And his interior lines are covered with vines and brushes. And so he has paths cut vertically and laterally to help his men move under them to protect them when they're under fire. So, I mean, he hasn't been in the position for too long, but look at, you know, you think, look at the stuff he's done. And meanwhile, Howard's like, ah, they're still working on it, you know? Well, Claiborne's division, they have some of the best fighting men in the entire Confederacy. If you think about it, commanding his brigades would be Hiram Granberry. We're going to talk about him. Great hair. He's going to lead the 615th, the 7th, the 10th, the 17th, 18th, and the 24th, 25th Texas regiments. Next to him is going to be Daniel Govan, we talked about. 24th, uh, 2nd, 24th, the 15th, 13th, the 6th, uh, 7th, and 18th, 8th, 19th Arkansas regiments, right? 
And last was that 115th Arkansas, the 5th Indi- fifth Tennessee, the 2nd Provisional Tennessee, the 35th Tennessee, and the 48th Tennessee. So Howard is, is get basically getting pushed to attack quickly by Sherman at this point. Yes. And he messaged him, early, or messaged him a little bit ago, ordering him to attack the enemy's flank and rear as soon as possible, which is going to put O.O. in a really tough spot because uh, considering yeah. – He's in the dark of his overall location. He's not sure where the flank is. Oh, and by the way, he's going up against the friggin' iron of the Confederacy. He and he knows this because and he's they actually know that. Has hit him in the Claiborne. You know, you know Howard wants to, wants to continue to scout and find that enemy flank because Howard knows something about flanks. I'm just saying he, <laughs> he does, does, right? He does. I can't imagine the like how he's feeling when he gets that order from Sherman, and he's like you know it's sent from sherman by thomas because thomas is howard's direct commander um in the army of the cumberland and it just says major general sherman wishes us to get the enemy's flank and rear as soon as possible as you said so it's like oh i guess i need to do the thing now right but and he, sherman he had to... also sent schofield a note stating we must break his line without scattering our troops too much and then break through good luck on the with that terrain <sighs> When he, when he gets these prisoners, he's pretty confident he's found the end. He thinks he has. So it's, you know, it's approaching, it's getting, you know, it's getting late in the afternoon okay. and it's, it's time for Howard to move. It, it, yep. He knows his time, right? He's getting pressured by Sherman. He thinks he knows where he's supposed to be now. He's going to choose to spearhead that attack is going to be commanded by the brigade of William B. Hazen in, in Thomas Wood's division. Now, real quick, tell you about, about Hazen. Okay, William ba- his name is William Babcock Hazen. He's a New Englander, man, from Vermont. From New- okay, he's born on September 27th of 1830 in West Haven, New York, West Harper, Vermont. He's close boyhood friends of James Garfield, Mary, yes. the future president, not That's the cast, cool. right? <laughs> so, and so. Hazen graduates from West Point in 1855. He's going to be 28th in his class. His classmates are going to be Dave McMurtry, Greg, Alexander Webb, mm-hmm. and George Ruggles, a confederate, right? And so that's what he's going to be. So after graduation, Hazen is going to is going to um, is going to fight the Comanches in Texas, and he's going to be he'll be the colonel of the 41st Ohio after Fort Sumter is fired upon. Now he'll fight under Don Carlos Buell, uh, his army of Ohio at Shiloh. He'll earn his star on November 29th of 1862 after his heroics, Mary, after securing the Union line at Hell's Half Acre at the Battle of Stones River. Mm-hmm. Remember we talked about that? Yep. You probably forgot. But, but, he, but he fought there and he helped defend that line. Now, Hayes is an interesting fella because you know, he was admired during the war, but he was hated by many after the war. Oh, right? Ambrose Bierce is like, I love how Ambrose Bierce describes him in the short story well it's his account of pickett's mill called the crime at pickett's mill which we'll talk more about at the end of the episode but he described hazen as the best hated man i ever knew he's aggressive arrogant tyrannical honorable truthful courageous skillful soldier faithful friend and one of the most exasperating of men and some other person said of him hazen is a synonym synonym for insubordination i mean he was disliked by custer he was disliked yeah. by Sherman after the war. They said he was loved in war and hated in peace. That's well, what they said he, about it. He himself. threw Sherman under the bus for a few things, which, you know, given some of the stuff about Sherman, some of it might have been true. And Sherman didn't really like that, but he didn't like Grant too much either. Like said shit about them as well. But he 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 just he just was whatever it was. He just he just was. But Hayes' men are from, from Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio, and, and and they for the most part they are going to advance. And immediately they're going to come under fire of that mm-hmm. cavalry, which is dismounted under John Kelly and that 24-year-old, the, the kid we just talked about. Now, infantry is usually pretty able to push through cavalry. And that's kind of what it's no different here. Hazen yeah. pushes right through them. But as they're marching through the deep woods, they're going to approach a deep ravine. And we've been there. We've seen this ravine. It's, okay, And it's, it's no picnic. It isn't. Right. Yeah, it, it's it's the worst. I don't know. I, th- I thought Kennesaw was bad for terrain, but this is you get there and you're like, how could they possibly fight a battle here? And, you know, before they, you know, right before they attack, you know, Wood goes to Howard and is like, are we really doing this? And Howard just says to him, attack. It's like I mean, just to set just the says, scope, of, yeah. set the scope for, for this race. So you want for the most part, you're walking through the woods. You're going to go to a deep down slope. You're going to come to a small stream about five feet long, wide, not that long. 
And then you're going to go up the slope again towards the other side. It's like a, it's like a bowl, right? Yeah. And it, it's just, it, it, the ground is virtually unchanged. If you go to Pickett's Mill today and you look at it, you're going to see the same exact thing that, 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 uh, that Hazen yeah. saw. It's just exactly the same. Now, he ex- Hazen expected to go through and come to the top pretty unscathed because he thought that he had found the end of the Confederate line and he was going to be able to get up there and flank them. But instead, what's going to happen? He's going to walk into the battle line of Hiram Granberry's Texans. Yeah. And Gran- to the right of Granberry, his brigade is going to be Daniel Govan, who who's to the right of Lucius Polk. Oh, and by the way, Mark Lowry, his Mississippi uh, Alabama brigade is going to be in reserve. So he kind of walked right into a bee's nest is what he ultimately did. Yeah. Now, you mentioned before, they got so close to the rebel line, one federal – when he, he didn't see much, much breastworks, but he yelled, damn you, we've caught you without your logs now. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what he said. And Claiborne's men have really had no time to entrench yet. Lieutenant Sebron Sneed of the 6th in the name. Texas. Great name. He's going to write, they came up bravely, but our men kept such a shower of minis in their faces that flesh and blood could not stand it. The balls flew as thick as hail and death stalked around. So what does that say? Immediately, it's coming into a quick firefight at yeah. close range. Now, But here's the thing. Instead of getting on the Confederate right, they were marching right into these brigades that made up the right flank of Johns' army, who it was happened to be probably the iron of the Confederacy in the Western yeah. theater. So oops. Right? Yeah, they're go- yeah, and the one thing that Beers talks about Ambrose Beers talks about when they go into this is they soon encounter what they call the deadline beyond which no man would advance. And this is basically like, you know, it's just men piled up and it's deadly fire that's coming at them. And the deadline is a well-defined edge of corpses. And he said this one at Pickett's Mill was one of the worst he'd ever seen. It, it, it just was. And Hayes' primary combatant on this line is going to be Hiram Granberry, the member yeah. of the all Civil War great hair team, without a doubt. Gran- and by the way, Granberry, he's, he, he's associated with Texas, but he's actually mm-hmm. from Mississippi. Yeah. So if you think about it, so real quick, his, his background, similar to John Brown Gordon, Granberry didn't have a military background. He was a lawyer and a judge before the war. Granberry moves to Texas in 1852 and got his law degree at Baylor uh, University in Waco, uh, Waco, Texas. He's going to become a lawyer in McClellan County, where he eventually became the chief justice of the county when he was just 25 years old, right? Yeah, he's Grand- an ambitious young man. Well, I mean, he's six foot two. He has a hundred. He's one hundred and sixty pounds. He's got that Pete Carmichael hair. He's a total rock star. <laughs> he does have the Pete Carmichael. He just, hair. he just does. And him and his wife Fanny are like the local rock stars in town. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because his name at that point was Granberry B E R R Y. He yep. changed it to Granberry B U R Y. Who the hell knows why? But around this time, well, he changes. That's how he changed. If you his go name. to Ringgold Gap, he's called Banbury. Well, that's true. Granberry is going to join the Waco Masonic Lodge in 92 and become a, the senior warden. And with a name like Hiram, I'm surprised he wasn't a, a mason earlier, to be, yeah. to be totally honest. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Now, when the Civil War breaks out, he's going to, be re- he's going to recruit a company called the Waco Guards, which is, is going to join the 7th Texas under a guy named John Gregg and his brigade. Now, soon later, at the Battle of uh, Fort Donaldson, February 15th of 1862, What's going to happen? Granberry is going to get his ass captured. Yeah. And he's going to become a prisoner of war. He'll be a guest of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mary is going to come to <laughs> Fort Warren in Boston Harbor like a wow. lot of Confederates do. He's going to be right up the street here. How about that? And the thing about his story, if you study Hiram Granberry, is the story of his wife is fascinating. And Granberry, when he's captured, he's, he comes to Fort Warren here in Boston Harbor. His wife, Fanny, is going to move to Boston to be around wow. him. Now, one day he, she's visiting Hiram and she starts complaining that she's not feeling well. And Hiram's cellmate is going to be a private citizen named Charles McGill, who happens to be a doctor. And who knows what the hell he's sitting in the jail for, but he, he got caught or something, but he's sitting in there. He overhears the symptoms and he tells Hiram, 
I think she has ovarian cancer. And he's like, okay. Oh so my God. Hiram tells the, his, his captors at Boston Harbor and Fort Warren this. And they go, you know something? We're going to parole you so you can go be with her. They let him out of jail. And he goes to Baltimore for treatment for his wife. Wow. They go to Baltimore. There's no treatment to be had. The Granberries now are going to go to Mobile, Alabama, hoping to find someone to treat her because her condition is getting worse. But unfortunately, she is going to die on March mm. 20th, 1863, of ovarian cancer. Wow. And Granberry is going to return to John Gregg's army we mentioned. And Gregg, upon seeing him, is going to write, Colonel Granberry returned today very low-spirited. Poor man, I sympathize with him in his misfortune. So Granberry is now the colonel of the Seven Texas under John Bell Hood, who you know he fought at Chickamauga before. At this point, he's going to get his star when he replaces the injured James Smith, where he fought again at Wrinkle Gap under Patrick Claiborne, and somehow he managed to change the name to Banbury. We talked you just mentioned Banbury, that, right? Banbury, and then there's Groven. <laughs> but, but so when 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 Hazen reaches the top of that ridge that day, he's going to meet a guy in, in Granbury who's battle tested both in war and in life. And at this point, Granbury is only 33 years old. He's been yeah. through all of this. He actually so, looks you, older in his pictures from this time too. Well, so you just, you just, you just think about these, these people as people, what they've yeah. gone through. And now he finds himself on this ridge fighting. So Hazen is going to march down uh, then down and then up across that ravine he's going to get within 20 paces of granberry's line but as they marched confusion sets in again and yep. this is the thing it's funny because while they're marching through these woods and it's a confusing place to go two of hazen's battalions on the left are going to veer off and they're going to walk away well, they the just woods. get lost and the officers they have to leave their horses behind because the terrain is so bad, they can't take them. So the officers, usually on horseback during the battles to help direct the men, are not on their horses. But what's going to happen is they're going to end up stumbling up and, and, and to the left of the line. They're going to end up in a cornfield. And what happens is they actually do flank and get behind the Confederate line. Just yep. by happenstance, they stumble their way to where they're supposed to be. And they, because of this, this movement actually, if they had more men, probably would have won the battle right then for the yeah. Union. But they didn't have as many guys. But what happens is that, unfortunately, that battalion was discovered. And so this is when the reserves from Lowry and William uh, Quarr's brigade yeah. are going to be rushed to the far right to repulse this Union movement. These are guys from Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee, Mississippi. But they're going to kind of sniff them out. And they're going to get around that right. And they're going to stop them. Now, Hazen is going to look around and he's going to see no support. No, he's got none. I mean, he's basically, though, been told by Howard that this is like, like Howard says to him, you're going to get like, you could be wrecked here. And, you know, Hazen goes into this thinking, I'm going to have support. And then quite quickly, he realizes, no, I'm not. And that's why, you know, Beers refers to this as why it's criminal is he's being sent in like Howard's system. Generally, you have to charge and turn the enemy's flank if you sacrifice your brigade. I mean, he he's literally looking around. He's got no, no support. one there. It's it's like he's a bad bra. He's got no support, Mary. Not, oh right. And, and so he he's looking around. And he doesn't know what, what he's going to do with that. Now, not only that, but again, you're you're going against the really strong part of the Confederate Army. Yeah. Behind him to his left is going to be a brigade by Benjamin Scribner. This is guys from Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And this is going to be in Richard Johnson's division of, of, of Palmer's 14th Corps we talked about. So they're still there. But Scribner is going to move forward, uh, forward towards... Basically, that dismounted cavalry we talked about, mm -hmm. uh, this is Kelly's guys on that Confederate far right, and they're going to stumble towards that grist mill, and they're going to be way going off that direction. But the problem is, is that Scribner is too far away to do anything for, for Hazen. He just, yep. He's just, there's not, too, not as many men, they're too far away. And so Hazen, who's got a portion of his men in that cornfield and the rest in that ravine, they're on an island and they're all by themselves. And this is going to be a huge issue because, because Hazen desperately needed Scribner 
but 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 Scribner was delayed by Kelly. So he ran into that 24-year-old cavalry guy who slowed Scribner down to keep him separated from Hazen to keep Hazen by himself. So you know, you talk about beating an army, you know, in in you know, piecemeal type thing, right? That's kind of what was happening because they could not get support to him. Yeah. Now Hazen is begging for support at this point. He's alone yeah. in the rain, holding his diaper. He's yeah. all by himself. He sends and- um, a captain from the 15th Ohio Regiment to go to the rear and ask Wood and Howard for reinforcements. And it's this time that this is how close they are. A shell lands nearby, and the fragment of the shell knocks the heel off of Howard's boot. And Howard apparently like was on his horse and he like threw his hands up and like well not hands his one arm you know up and he was like just said to them i'm afraid to look down he thought his leg had been shot off but it turns out he just has a badly bruised foot he can't he has to get off the horse at that point because he can't ride he can't walk but you know this this happens when this guy is going back to ask for reinforcements that's how close they are that the artillery fire is now starting to hit them. the other issue they're having is every time hazen sends a messenger to get support guess what happens the messengers keep getting shot yep they get the message they start going they get dropped so hazen by now you know he's he realizes that his 15 man 1500 man reg uh, brigade is going to be sacrificed and he just says well this is it then He's, he's, he's by himself. He can't get any support. Hazen had no choice at this point but to fall back. So he's going to order a full re- withdrawal down that ravine. But the problem is that the fire from Claiborne's men was so severe, they couldn't move. They were pinned down. They yeah. wouldn't let them retreat. And so a lieutenant in Hazen's staff, a, a writer who you mentioned a few times now named Ambrose Burst, He's going to write probably the best description of this disjointed disaster yeah. of a Union attack. And he's going to write, the battle was at an end, but there was still some slaughter that was possible to occur before nightfall as this wreck of our brigade drifted back towards the forest. And then he writes, we met Gibson's brigade. This is William Gibson, the guy yeah. who, was supposed to, who was supposed to be right behind them, which had been made in column and should have been five minutes behind our heels with another five minutes behind its own, as 45 minutes had elapsed during which the enemy had destroyed us and was prepared to do the same kind, kindly office to our successors. So what's Beer saying? He's saying Gibson was supposed to be right behind Hazen, five minutes, but instead took 45 minutes. And in that 45 minutes, for whatever reason, communication, terrain, because he couldn't move, Hazen became engaged by himself and he got slaughtered, is what he's saying. Yeah. And you can see why he's pissed off about this. No oh, question. yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's very like it's a small battle. It's only lasts about an hour. But what Hazen and his guys go through is just, like it's terrible and then hazen gets to the back you know he finally manages to fall back but he like he's so pissed off about it and it's not until six o'clock so this is like you know maybe half an hour or so after they've started that howard gets a message from thomas saying sherman had canceled the attack at 5 15 well so and and there was like so miscommunications happening and all this so at 6.30, Howard orders Neffler's brigade forward in order to keep the Confederates in, trend, um, in check while the rest of the of Howard's guys dig entrenchments. And Neffler, along oh. with the 37th Indiana and the 78th PA, um, they do, they end up exchanging, like, they, they end up falling back to a position where they're able to exchange fire with the Confederates until nightfall. But this allows the entrenchments to be dug. But still, the damage has been done. This has been. This was like probably one of the most horrific hours in the Civil War. Is here well, dur- during this whole Hazen thing when he's pinned down. It's going to allow Claiborne to improve his breastworks yep. to get more ammo. It's going to allow reserves from Lowry and Quarles to get into position. This forty-five minutes cost Hazen five hundred men. That's yeah. what this forty-five minutes cost, and so. As bad, you know, as bad as Hazen got it. Before, you know, before we get, before we jump ahead here a little bit and talk about Neffler, as as bad as Hazen got it, Gibson's William Gibson's oh, guys got it just as bad. He gets it just as bad so, too. So by the by the time by the time Gibson gets to this ravine, because he's going to go to that same route, the Rebs now with Lowry and Quarles have even more men, more ammo, yep. and they're entrenched better. 
Mm-hmm. When Gibbs's men attacked, they were slaughtered in droves. Some regiments had 50% casualties. One regiment lost six straight color bearers. Every time a guy yeah. picked up the flag, he was cut right down. One of Gibson's men said, this surely is not war. This is butchery Is during this battle, yeah. how this was. So this battle starts around 4.30, 5 o'clock or so. And now it's approaching nightfall. And so as, as Hazen and Gibson's men are going to get pounded, you mentioned before, Howard's going to realize that any future attacks is a complete friggin' waste of time. Yeah, and Sherman's it's, already told him, you know, you know Sherman called off at 5.15, the message doesn't get to him until 6. He does. I mean, this is always, this is like me telling you to mix a water once in a while. It's, no, it's no one's going to, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference, but it's a complete waste of time. With darkness falling, that ravine is getting filled with dead and dying men are literally covering the entire ground. So Howard is going to need to do something about these dead and dying men. He wants to get the wounded yeah. out of there. Now, this is when he's going to send that last brigade in, this brigade of Frederick Neffler, right? Yep. He only has two regiments, the 19th and 59th Ohio. It's a small brigade. Mm-hmm. He's, Neffler's going to be in charge of going in to get these wounded. Neffler's going to begin his quotation fingers assault down the ravine, because it's really just kind of, you know, yeah. um, to go get the guys. This is at, again, this is now two full hours after Hazen started his initial assault. So the battle's almost over. Yeah. Darkness is falling, and the shooting is going to basically peter out. And it's just occasional shots. You know how it is. There's very not yeah. a lot of darkness um, battle. So at this point, this Confederate and Union men are about 100 yards apart. And they're just kind of sitting there. They're catching their breath. They're kind of getting into that relaxation mode. Like, yeah. It's nighttime. We can catch our breath a little bit. This shit's almost over. It's about 10 o'clock at night now, and it was pitch black, especially when you figure the heavy tree cover, right? Claiborne, though, isn't done. No. He, he decides what he wants to do is he wants to seize the initiative now. And even though it's dark, he wants to attack the Union men under a cover of darkness while they're sitting on that ravine. So he's like, well, I've got them over a barrel. I have. I want to seize the initiative. I know it's dark. I'm going to do it. Claiborne's going to write later. It needed but the brilliance of, of this night attack to add luster to the achievements of Granberry in his brigade in the afternoon. So he's going for it. He's like, yeah. freaking screw this. Let's go get him. Claiborne's men are going to charge down that ravine, and they're going to capture a bunch of Neffler's guys who were captured before they even realized what the hell was even happening. Yeah. They just they just got caught. This is going to be one of the most one of the most Confederate lopsided victories in the entire war, and it was complete done deal. Yeah. And when the battle was over, one Reb is going to write, and you you mentioned this earlier about this quote he talked about. He says, "Dead men met the met the eye in every direction, and in one place I stopped, and I counted fifty dead men in a circle of thirty feet of me." I've seen many dead men, but I've never seen anything before that may be sick like looking at these men did. So what does yeah. that say? It just goes to show these are battle-tested guys. This is 1864, and they're getting to the point now where you can still be sickened by the stuff you see. Yeah, yeah. and this guy was talking about, like, you know, the the wounds, a lot of them were in their heads. So, of course, like you have like blood and brains everywhere and stuff. They found one corpse with 47 bullet holes in it. You know, similar stories to what at, at Spotsylvania. And like the the same guy said men were lying in all sorts of shapes and just as they had fallen or in like, you know, weird positions or whatever. But yeah, it was enough to make them sick. And there was one guy that he was on picket duty. And when, when the sunlight, you know, when it was light, he had to leave because it was so bad what he saw and this is a guy the veteran you know kind of he's been through it all and he's seeing this at Pickett's Mill and it's terrible um and like I said though it's a small battle the carnage here is very horrific it's like a smaller version of Spotsylvania um deadly second deadliest battle in the end campaign 1600 Union soldiers are going to be casualties uh 448 Confederates Woods Division has a 20 percent casualty weight rate and that's with Hazen's men in it too this entire battle is going to be prove to be a gigantic embarrassment. Now, this is coming yep. off of New Hope, where they got smoked too. This is going to be another big embarrassment for Union. 
Now, I want you to listen real close, Mary, and you can hear what William Sherman said about this battle in his battle report and his memoirs. You ready? Listen close. Yep. You hear that? What do you say? That is the sound of silence. That is he William say Tecumseh Sherman. Not, about... He did not write a word about this battle in his memoirs. And that is one thing that pisses Ambrose Burse off is that. And right. when Ambrose Burse wrote his crime at Pickett's Mill, he said, "Is it is ignored by General Sherman in his memoirs, yet Sherman ordered it. General Howard wrote an account of the campaign of which it was an incident and dismissed it in a single sentence. Yet General Howard planned it, and was an and it was an isolated and independent action under his eye. Now Howard writes a little bit more than a sentence about it, but still, this is not Howard's best day in the Civil War, and Sherman ignoring it completely is terrible. You know, it's like what did those men fight for? So I understand why Beers is so um, pissed off about it, but Howard wrote something after it too that this battle really affected him. Um, and it's in his memoirs. He to go. He has a few pages on Pickett's Mills. And he said that during the war, a few sad scenes impressed me more than any others. One was the field after the Battle of Gettysburg. A second scene was the battlefield of Antietam. But these things, not happy to relate, were matched at Pickett's Mills. That opening in the forest, faint fires here and there revealing men wounded, armless, legless, or eyeless. Some with heads bound with cotton strips, some standing and walking nervously around, some sitting with bended forms and some prone upon the earth. Who can picture it? A few men in despair had resorted to drink for relief. The sad sounds from those in pain were mingled with the oaths of the drunken and the more heartless. And that's what he said about it. So he's, this is a guy who's been at Gettysburg and he was in the thick of it at Antietam. And I think he was in the Westwood. So he saw some pretty bad shit. And he's saying it's not matched at Pickett's Mills. And he has to stay in this area from about eight o'clock until one in the morning. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, he can't he can't move around too much now because his foot is so badly bruised, right? He can't get on a horse, he can't walk without help. But he said of that night, he said, That night will always be a sort of nightmare to me. I think perdition here or hereafter can be worse. Well, Beers wrote a lot of like horror stories, and ironically, yeah. he ended up disappearing, and no one ever knows what happened. Yeah. Beers, but he had he, he wrote about this again about the the aborted the assault that Pickett's Mill belonged to those events that are in their very nature foredoomed to oblivion. So he's like this an absolute mess. So the next day on May twenty eighth, Howard's able to get some reinforcements and, and supplies, and they actually get the upper hand the next day at the Battle yeah. of Dallas. We're not going to talk a lot about that, but he does get a little bit of little bit of revenge. And the both armies are going to basically remain in this area until June 4th, when Joseph E. Johnson is going to again order a full withdrawal. And then Sherman's going to move ahead to occupy that vacated rebel Dallas New Hope Church Pickett's Mill line. Yeah. But he's, he's he'll soon again move towards Atlanta. And Johnson will find another line to defend, which is going to eventually lead to the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain. They're yeah. going to keep falling back, falling back, falling back. Sherman's not going to cross the Chattahoochee until July 8th, thanks to this effort of Johnston and his falling back strategy to defend. This advance to Atlanta was supposed to be quick, and it took over two months. Don't forget, he talked about the, the bees being across the Chattahoochee in five yeah. days. It's two months now. So from the Battle of New Hope Church until Atlanta fell, most of the battles were basically – another thing, too, was true battles of trench warfare at that point on. And ultimately – and this is what ultimately doomed Johnson for the most part because yep. what happens? If your strategy is to fall back and you get stuck in trenches, that kind of takes that option away from you. Yep. And it's going to eventually lead to an eventual defeat in this campaign – now, what Atlanta finally did when it finally does fall on September second, you know Sherman is going to lose thirty four thousand guys of his one hundred fifteen thousand men that he started with, while Johnson yeah. is going to pay a higher price. But not only losing this, the, that vital city of Atlanta, he's going to lose fifty percent of his army in this yeah. this delaying aspect. So what's it, what's it worth now? Today, if you go to the, if you go to the Pickettsville battlefield. It is absolutely pristine, yep. and it's similar to what it looked like at the time of the battle. Uh, they have some original cannon, if you go there, right outside of the visitor yep. center. 
and you can actually hike the entire battlefield and you can basically walk along the entire Union and Confederate lines as they saw them. So it's really it's so worth doing that because it you know, you go you read about the battle and, you know, you're like, wow, this is really horrific. This is terrible. You, you know, highly recommend reading The Crime of Pickett's Mill written by Ambrose Bierce. Um, I read an article where someone was like, you know, it was bad, but I don't know if I'd call it a crime. I'm like, I understand why he's calling it a crime because Sherman's not writing about it and all those men that fought there aren't getting remembered, you know, because of that, he's leaving it out. It's like, it's like, why leave it out? But, you know, to see it, you go there and it really hits home. Like, why were they doing this? Because you see how steep the ravine is and like Hazen's guys come upon that. And you you do, you understand why Howard couldn't see some of the stuff with his, with, with the glass that, it's going to be obscured, um, but it's it's worth it to visit. It is one of my honestly, it's been one of my favorite battlefields just because you it's know, so lot, pristine. A lot of times we'll, we'll go to you know the, the field of Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, and you you'll, you'll hear people talk and they'll go, you know, what was Lee thinking going across this terrain? If you've gone to if you go to Pickett's Mill, and I I, I defy you to find any worse ground for an army to march across than at Pickett's Mill. And if you go there, you can stand right on that ridge and you can look down it and you can see the stream and you can see how they, where they would have to climb up to get to Granberry's guys. You had to be a special type of guy to get to that top of the next ridge. And um, it's amazing that this battle is not studied more because it is, it is absolute pure carnage while everything's going on in the east and this push to Atlanta is going on. I think that because the Atlantic campaign moves so briskly after that, it goes right to Battle of Dallas, goes to Kennesaw, it goes to Chattahoochee, it goes to Atlanta. But I think in you know Jonesboro, but I think I think for the most part, if you take a step back and you go visit a place like Pickett's Mill and you go and walk that ground, you can get a real true appreciation for what these poor bastards had to deal with. Yeah. And I'm talking both sides, because it is a place where literally you you walk 20 feet, you got to hold on to stuff as you're walking because yep. you were in the you are in the middle of inclines deep deep woods rocks you know water everything and to, to, to be a type of guy to be able to fight in this environment is a special special breed and um if you go check it out they'll be happy to see you it's a great yep. visitor center they're very friendly and people who work there the displays they have the little they have like a little museum there too and it's it's really worth checking out as well and it's so just you know to see it and just to i think this battle needs to be obviously studied even more especially since sherman leaves it out of his memoirs and it's not because it's not interesting it's because it is a huge blunder on his part it's also a blunder on howard's too howard's involved in the planning of it um you know and same same with thomas j wood but i i do feel sorry for the two of them um in a way because howard is coming off that chancellorsville that ghost and he's told by sherman you need to do this. And Wood comes up to him and said, are the orders still to attack? And all Howard can say to him is just attack. He just says one word, attack. And, you know, Wood is questioning him before that, like, is this a good idea? And I understand why Wood is doing that. He's got the ghost of Chickamauga because when he was told, he's told by Howard to move his men and Wood's like, but my men are here in a good position. I don't want to move them. He's saying that probably because last time I moved my men, we had problems. And I was blamed for it, caused a huge hole, right? So these are two guys that have ghosts following them from other battles. They've made mistakes. And it's not a good day for them, and it's not a good day for Sherman. But I think Sherman not writing about it is um doesn't <laughs> it doesn't get mentioned enough. It's it's one of those things where I'm like, no. the more the more I study it, the more I'm like, why? Like, why did he he forget these men that fought here? No, it's 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 a tough spot, and it's a tough spot for Howard because I mean this is a situation where again. The communication in the terrain was such that again you're fighting on an on, on enemy ground if you're if you're a Union guy, but even if you're fighting on Confederate ground, I mean the the ground that Granberry and Govan and Lucius Polk and Quarles and Lowry and all these guys fought on, um, it's truly truly brutal ground where there was no such thing as linear formations. This was really the beginning of trench warfare in the West. It really, really was. Ironically, around the same time that Overland at Spotsylvania was taking place. Yep, it's happening so you can, too. You can see that sea change in May of 1864 where things were changing strategically. So uh, I think it's a good place to drop this off here, Mary. I think I think this is this is one this is one of those places if you're if you're an Eastern person, if you're a Gettysburg person, 
if you find yourself in Georgia, go out to Pickett's Mill. It's just outside of Atlanta, between Atlanta and Chattanooga. You'll 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 be happy you did it because you'll yep. go there. You can walk it. It's a great hike, and it's pristine and it's virtually unchanged. It really, really is. Yeah, and I mean, just before we wrap up, is you know, on the Confederate side of this, you have Claiborne, who's having he does have a very good day here. Um, you know, and there was one story I found. It's not really to do with Pickett's Mills, but it's to do with Sherman having a beer with a Confederate soldier after it's years after the civil war. And he asked the guy, who'd you fight for? And the guy said, I fought, I fought with Pat Claiborne and Sherman actually toasted Claiborne and said, when we saw Claiborne, we always knew we were going to have to fight. And that definitely happened at Pickett's Mills. And Claiborne was, you know, doing the stuff he learned worked at Ringgold Gap. He did it again. He hid his men he was able to use the terrain to his advantage so that his men wouldn't get hit as much and all that. So he has, you know, and like you said, the union guys are going up against kind of the steel of the Confederates in the Western theater at this point. People never really understand and appreciate how good of a, a soldier and fighter Hiram Granberry was. He really, yeah. he really, really was. So what's up for us next? What's new for us? So this? next, I think we're going to be going back into the Overland campaign again. I think. I think we're going back east, Mary. We talked yeah, a little we're... Cold Harbor, I think, right? Yep, we're going back think... east. Um, we do have an episode coming up at some point. We are finally going to be doing an episode sometime around the anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg about Oliver Otis Howard. But it's not going to be about Howard at Gettysburg. It's going to be about his career after Gettysburg mm -hmm. to the end of the Civil War. So that's the two that we have uh, coming up over the next little while. Excellent. Speaking of Gettysburg, don't forget our big event, Mary, July 1st, 430. Yes. The Spangler Farm, partnering up with our friends at the Gettysburg Foundation. If you want to go check out the Spangler Farm, the 11th Corps Field Hospital, you want to see where uh, Lowell Armistead died. If you want to see where George Nixon died, um, come see it. It's a free tour. Uh, come check that out with us. Yeah, given and, uh, our friend forward. Mark Blanchard from the Gettysburg Foundation is going to be giving that tour. He's given us a tour there before. He's very good at it. So thank you to Mark and the Gettysburg uh, Foundation for partnering with us to do that um that is july 1st at 4 30 p.m and then um, another thing we're going to be announcing soon is we're going to do a get together that night probably at four score but we're just uh -huh. ironing out the details for that and we will announce that soon cool all right well off we go mary any final words from you finch Roo? well thanks for bringing it as you always do well it's always fun talking about these battles so mm -hmm. off we go mary Oh, Canada. Yep. We go to Canada tomorrow, a little field trip for us. So have a good yep. time with that. So off we go. Canada, Darren, off we go. So Canada, Darren, thanks Canada. to all of our <laughs> listeners for these 109 episodes for watching or listening to this silly little thing we do. Uh, obviously no, uh, live, no Facebook or no YouTube live stream this week, but sometime on Monday, Memorial day, we will be um, hopefully doing a Facebook live from Elmira as well as possibly from Colonel Ir um, David Ireland's grave. Monday, we're going to be at yeah. Elmira Prison Hospital. The other, I mean, Prison uh, Confederate Field Hospital. What do you say? Hospital. I'm thinking of the Spangler. We're going to Elmira, the Confederate um, prisoner war camp up there in Elmira, New York. Uh, and we're going to be doing that. And then we're going to go see the grave sites of David Ireland and John yeah. Cleveland Robinson over there in Binghamton. So hopefully, you uh, watch this spot. It'll be on Facebook Live probably on Monday, Memorial Day. So yeah. have a safe weekend, Mary. Well, as everybody else, Enjoy your long weekend, holiday weekend here in the United States of America, and hopefully everybody has a safe and one, uh, good weekend, weekend for everybody. So any final words? We, we did this already, but any final words again? No. So thank you, All everybody, right. and we will see you again next time. All right. Peace out, everybody. Have a good weekend. See you all later. Bye. Bye.